<clears throat> so, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm Piermarco Gannarsa from the fact, Scientific Committee of this Congress. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, plenary speaker, for today's program, who is uh, Nicola Fusco. <coughs> so, I'm particularly happy to introduce him also because I know him very well. I mean, since many, many years ago. In fact, uh, since university, when I, when I, we were both students in Pisa, it's quite normal, but uh, Nicola is uh, one year older than me. So when I arrived as a freshman, well, he had completed uh, his first year and he wasn't there, wasn't there. So in fact, I, I learned about him before we actually met. And the reason he wasn't there, well, in those years, it was very easy, in fact, to, to disappear as a student from Scuola Normale. Uh, the main uh, reason being, well, we were kicked out all the time. Uh, but not, no, that wasn't the case for Nicola. After completing his first year, well, he thought well. He said, uh, no thanks, I like Naples better. So he went back to uh, beautiful Naples, where he spent uh, more or less the rest of his career with few exceptions, like uh, Salerno, then Florence, a uh, few years, uh, and, uh, well, numerous exceptions as a visiting professor, as he, since he has been visiting several institutions all over the world. Um, lately, this university in Finland, I have to get it right, Juveskula, <laughs> uh, where, um, where he has been spending for years <clears throat> part for four years uh, uh, one semester. So Nicola is one of the world leaders in the area of calculus of variations and uh, PDEs, mainly elliptic, which is uh, well a traditional research area in Italy that uh, has a long history and occupies uh, well a lot of space in the Italian mathematical uh, scenario. He wrote more than uh, 100 papers and a <clears throat> very appreciated book on geometric measure theory with uh, Ambrosio and Pallara and he <coughs> published in all the top journals and had very <coughs> highly cited papers. So also his distinctions are uh, astonishing, national and international. Uh, in Italy he got the Cacciopoli Prize in 95 from the Un Italian Mathematical Society, the <coughs> Tartufari Prize from the Accademia dei Lincei, of which then he became uh, a member, and finally the Amerio Prize in 2014 from the Instituto Lombardo in Milan. Uh, <coughs> well, he also got many international uh, distinctions, uh, being speakers at the <coughs> ICM in uh, Hyderabad at the U European Mathematical Society and above all this uh, ERC <coughs> grant he got in 2009 and uh, he used to well foster research in this area very much in Italy and cover a lot of students in fact he has been having several students during his career who are now established mathematicians like uh, Giuseppe Bingione in Parma for example but I think that uh, I have to miss uh, the rest of uh, uh, <coughs> the description of uh, Nicola's career because otherwise I will take all the time and I'm happy to invite him to speak. The title of his talk, as you see, is the Stability and Minimality for a Non-Local Variational Problem. <coughs> okay, thank you very much, Pier Marco, for this uh, very nice, very, really very nice introduction. Let me thank the organizers for inviting me this is my first time in Rio, and uh, I really hope it won't be the last, because I really like the place. And uh, let me just warn uh, the experts. Uh, the problem I'm going to talk about is essentially isoperimetric problem with a non-local term. And let me warn the, my colleagues who are uh, experts in the field. Uh, I tried to prepare my slides for uh, people who are not experts in the field. So the expert can sleep and maybe the non-expert can try to get something, I hope so. Okay, so as I say, this is a, essentially a variant of the isoperimetric problem, but it comes from uh, 
uh, a problem in uh, chemistry. We all know what are polymers, and in practical life, we uh, often uh, meet uh, copolymers, which are chains or different, of different polymers, in particular dye block uh, uh, copolymers, which are made by chains of two different kinds of polymers. Let us call them A and B. Uh, what is interesting, also from the mathematical point of view, especially from the mathematical point of view, is the pattern that these chains have. And what I'm trying to explain in this talk is that, in fact, we can understand quite rigorously uh, the formation of this pattern, which depends. So the formation of the, uh, in fact, these patterns you don't see. What, uh, uh, glues and silicon are typical dye block copolymers that you are very familiar with. You don't see any pattern. You see them homogeneous. The pattern that, uh, that you can see is only at, uh, at a level of nanometers. But nevertheless, these patterns are very interesting from the point of mathematical point of view. Uh, let me show two examples. These are pictures, uh, true pictures taken um, with the electronic microscope. Of course, the colors are faked. And immediately, you recognize two typical patterns that you will see often in this talk, lamellar patterns and sphere. There are the two materials, the blue one and the red one. Uh, in fact, the patterns that are observed, and the next picture is taken from the Journal of Chemistry, are uh, even more complicated and interesting from the mathematical point of view. As you can see uh, in this picture, you see what kind of patterns uh, they observe when you have a uh, in general, you don't have the same amount of polymers A and polymer B. You have different proportions. So in the first picture, you see that uh, polymer A, the blue one, is immersed. The, the, remain, the white color is the remaining polymer. It uh, takes uh, a spherical pattern when the percentage is not too big. Then if you increase the percentage of polymer uh, a, uh, you may observe cylindrical pattern. Then if you increase even more, you observe these double geroids and double diamonds, which are more intricate patterns. So again, this is a pattern of polymer A inside polymer B. And finally, uh, when you are close to 50-50, you get these lamellar patterns, uh, also shown in the picture above. What is interesting from the mathematical point of view is that all these patterns are constant mean curvature sets. And we, well, as I said, what we try to understand is why this happened. Of course, if you want to understand this, you need a model. And the model that I'm talking about was provided by two Japanese physicists, Ota and Kawasaki, in 1986. It's very simple from the mathematical point of view. Because the idea is that you start with a function u, which define, which describe the density of the two material. So let's say u is equal to 1 if you are in purely material A. u is equal to minus 1 if you are purely in material B. Of course, the, the function may get intermediate values if there are transition layers. And uh, of course, you have to fix the amount of material of one kind and another. And one way of doing this is simply uh, fixing the average of the function u. Once you know the average, uh, you get the amount of the relative amount of the two materials. OK, so uh, the model proposed by Yota Kawasaki is simply this one. Uh, yeah, to minimize this functional, uh, where u is the density, as I said, this function v of u, this is the non-local term, is a function which solves with suitable boundary condition. I don't want to be precise here. I don't want to be too technical here. The equation minus Laplacian of v equal to u, which is the density functions, minus the, this average. And the, the idea is that the pattern you observe is obtained when you minimize among all possible density functions, which satisfy this constraint. Uh, why this model is reasonable? Uh, well, the constant here, gamma 0, is a positive constant, depends on the materials. But uh, in practical, uh, if you want to use in, for practical purposes this 
uh, model, epsilon is very small. So epsilon is very small, 1 over epsilon is very big. If 1 over epsilon is very big and you want to minimize this quantity, the function u must be either 1 or minus 1. Well, of course, you pay a, a layer. You have a, a, if here you are 1 and here you are minus 1, you have a transition layer. But uh, and uh, to pass from 1 to minus 1, you have to pay a uh, huge gradient. But this is compensated by the fact that uh, there is an epsilon. So if you only consider the blue part of this energy, what you want to try to do is to separate in two clearly uh, 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 clear parts the two materials. But you have also this term. This term, uh, OK, the, my, my friends who work in PDE, PDEs know very well that if you want to minimize this term, instead, uh, you do better to split the material in several different small pieces. So there are two competing terms. The blue one wants to put the two material one apart from the other, and the red one wants to split. And the combination of the two, remember you have to minimize the sum of the two guys, uh, in the end results in the patterns that you observe. OK, so this is the model. And I said the parameter is very small. So the first thing you do as a mathematician, which is not bad from the practical point of view, is to uh, send epsilon to 0. And if you send epsilon to 0, so this is the original model, uh, you get uh, in the limit, in the limit again, I've been very sloppy here, but my uh, friends who are experts know what I mean. It's a gamma limit. You get these energy, this term stays here, the constant just becomes a little bit different, and this is uh, the guy which replaces the blue term. So here it's the total variation of the gradient. But if you pass to the limit, send epsilon to the limit, the function u has only two values, minus 1 and 1. So what happens? This is your omega, and there will be two regions, one where u is 1, and the other one when u is minus 1. So in fact, what you do when you pass to the limit with these two regions, where u is equal to 1 or minus 1, you detect a set E. For me, E will be the set where the density is 1, or its complement. And this term is precisely, this total variation of the gradient is precisely the measure of the layer times the jump. The jump is 2 because you pass from minus 1 to 1. So the measure of the layer times the jump. In the end, there is one half here. You get the perimeter. The perimeter of the set E inside omega. The perimeter of this. I, I use the word perimeter uh, just to not to use in two dimension the length, in three dimension the area of the surface, and in higher dimension whatever it is, the n minus 1 Hausdorff measure. So this problem, if instead of talking of the function u, now the function u is only these two values, you talk about the set E, uh, is immediately transformed in a geometrical problem. Minimize among all sets E, which are contained in omega, this quantity under the, the fact that remember that the total mass is of, of, of the one material and the other is fixed. Uh, here it's written, the, the, the volume constraint is written on this name, this, uh, in this way. In the difference between the measure of E and the measure of the remaining part is fixed. Okay, this is the model, and I want to say I started from the polymers, but this model is used now in many, many problems of pattern formation, uh, not only to detect the patterns of polymers. For instance, if you were an animal deciding long time ago that you prefer to have two colors on your skin, two different pigmentations. There are several biological reasons for this. Well, you had to decide in which way to arrange the uh, colors. And uh, these two fishes, tropical fishes, uh, give you an answer. Again, you see spherical spots and lamelle. So this is not by chance, as we will see. OK, so this is our problem. and. Uh, let me say what are the uh, 
uh, issues from the mathematical point of view. As we have seen in the previous pictures, all these features are more or less periodic, almost periodic. So the first question that mathematicians try to uh, understand is, can we say that minimizers of this quantity must be necessarily arranged in a periodic way? Let me say that uh, this is an almost completely unsolved problem. There is a paper by Stefan Muller which deals with a one-dimensional version of this model. So it, it is a toy problem because the, mo the, the model is not interesting in one dimension. Nevertheless, it proves rigorously that the patterns are periodic, but uh, that's it. In higher dimension, there are two papers, one by Alberti, Choksi, and Otto, and one by Spadaro, who try to solve this conjecture, but they only are able to show that uh, certain quantity related to the energy are uh, equally distributed, but not that the patterns are, are, uh, are periodic. The problem is that I'm uh, trying to uh, discuss today is instead uh, uh, the other one. Assume from the beginning that you work with uh, periodic sets. May we prove nevertheless that those pictures that we had at the beginning are in fact minimizers of the energy or local minimizers because physicists will tell you immediately we don't care about global minimizers if it is enough to locally minimize the problem. You mean minimizers among periodic competitors? Among, among periodic competitors, yes. So I assume that uh, working with periodic guys and I want to know if, uh, if uh, uh, local minimizers must be necessarily of this form. Okay, uh, there, are a lot of, there were a lot of papers uh, devoted to this problem and uh, for instance, Choksi Stenberg calculated the second derivative of the energy. Uh, Rendenby proved in a series of papers that uh, certain of the configurations that we saw before are in fact, uh, in some cases, local minimizers with respect to certain variations. I mean, there is a huge bibliography in the subject, but uh, uh, there were no uh, clear way of, uh, how to say, encompass all these results and all the things that we observe. Okay, so, as I said to uh, Camillo, I will assume that, uh, um, work, that I work with periodic sets. So I will assume to work with a flat torus, which is essentially the unit cube, and that my set C are periodic guys. Okay, so I'm assuming periodicity from the very start. So again, the problem is this. Minimize the perimeter of E inside the torus plus this uh, non-local term, which as before solves the equation. In this case, since you are working with periodic condition, you don't have boundary condition. You just impose that the average of V is equal to zero. And again, the volume is fixed. Okay, first of all, I say this, of course, to non-expert. The experts know this very well. Uh, okay, I minimize the, this energy. If I am a minimizer, this is calculus one, my derivative is zero. So if I am a minimizer, my derivative, which can be taken in a precise sense, is zero. This translates in this condition. The fact that E is a minimizer, so the derivative is zero, translates into this equation where H is, we call it mean curvature, but it's a sum of the principal curvatures. Uh, gamma is a constant here, V is the function, must be constant. And uh, in fact, observe that if gamma is equal to zero, this is the constant mean curvature equation. And in fact, all the pictures that we saw are const were constant, the, the spheres, the lamelle, the cylinders and the gyroids where they were all constant mean curvature. Okay, so this is a necessary condition. If you want to be a minimizer, you must solve this equation. You must be a regular critical point. But as I said, I'm not just interested in minimizers, I'm also interested in local minimizers. And I must 
understand what does local minimality mean. Okay, well, to define local minimality, I have to define the distance between two sets. Assume this is my set E. I take another set F, which is also periodic, but, and that's the same volume. Okay, assume this is your set E. And I have to say, what is the distance between E and F? Of course, since I'm working in the flat torus, I, nothing changes if I, if I translate the set. So what I have to do if I want to define uh, the distance properly, I have to uh, consider all possible translation, translations of the competitor F, and what I want to do is minimize the volume of the symmetric difference. The distance between two sets, I take F, I move F in order to minimize this symmetric difference, and the, the, the minimum of all the symmetric difference upon all possible translations is the distance between the two sets. It's, tell, it's, it's telling you how they really differ one from the other. Okay, and then you are a local minimizer if uh, you minimize the uh, functional among all sets which have the same volume and whose distance is between zero and delta. So I'm not, a global minimizer will be lowering the energy among all possible competitors. Here you minimize just without moving too much. So you locally minimize. But what you have to keep in mind is that the distance is measured uh, by taking the, the volume of the symmetric difference. So it's what we call an L1 distance. Okay, so something that can be proved easily, this is just uh, the first statement is just a, a more or less uh, easy consequence of the Georgi's regularity theory for minimal surfaces. Remember here in the energy, the perimeter term is from the point of view of regularity, the dominant term, let me rewrite the energy, is the perimeter plus this volume term. Where V solves this equation. So it's not a surprise that you have this regularity theorem. Uh, so if you have a local minimizer, then the boundary of E is C3 up to a singular set which has only dimension less than n minus 8. This is the typical regularity that you get for minimal surfaces. And you don't care about the fact that it can be singular parts because from the practical point of view, we are interested to this model in two and three dimensions. So in two and three dimensions, uh, local minimizers are C3. And in fact, the Yulin and Pisante proved that they are C infinity. And once they are C infinity, you are analytic. But this is not our problem. The regularity is just two know that you have some regularity. Our problem, I say it again, is to understand if local minimizers of this functional are those guys that we have seen at the beginning or not. So we know that if you want to be a minimizer or a local minimizer, you have to be a critical point. So you have to solve, I rewrite the equation. This is a necessary condition. The first derivative, the first derivative of the energy must be zero. This must be constant on the boundary of E. Now, the idea that we, we mean Emilio Cerbi and Massimiliano Morini from Parma University had is let's try to use the second derivative of the energy. Of course, it would be nice, this would be nice and easy if the functional were in some sense convex, which is not. So it was not obvious that a condition uh, based on second derivative would work to detect which pattern are local minimizers and which are not. So let's try second variation. And how you define the second variation? OK, I don't want to be too technical, but the idea is very simple. Again, this is your flat torus. This is your set E, 
Okay, it will never be something like this, but let me draw something in general. You define in general the second variation in this way. You start with a vector field, x, in the torus, and you start moving in the direction given by, indicated by the vector field. And you flow along this direction according to this law, and then you calculate, you call ET the configuration of the set. So maybe a minute after you are in this situation, this is your set ET. So you can, at time zero, you are your set. Then you move along this flow, and you evaluate the energy, and you take the second derivative of the energy uh, at time zero, simply. But be careful. We have to require for the vector field this condition, because remember, the original problem was to minimize that quantity, this quantity, under a volume constraint. If we impose this condition on the vector field, uh, we are sure that during the flow, the volume is preserved. Uh, so we are still working with real competitors. So you just change in this way. OK. So first step is to evaluate this second variation. This is a non-trivial task and uh, was uh, undertaken by Choksi and Stenberg in 2007. And this is the very bad formula. The very bad formula, which at the beginning looks a little awful, but it's not too bad. Uh, these two guys, this is the tangential derivative, this is a normal to the set E, uh, are simply the terms that you get when you, do, when you calculate the second variation of the perimeter, the second derivative of the perimeter. This B is the sum of the square of the principal curvature. These two terms, G is the green function for the, for the flat torus. Why the green function? Because here we are solving this Laplace equation. These two terms come from this extra term. Sorry, here there is a, a constant gamma. OK. But no matter how bad it is, it is a formula. So you can take one of the patterns that you have before, try to see if they solve this equation. As you will see later, this is not very, very difficult. And then try to see. Uh, how is the uh, second derivative? And you calculate the second derivative. OK, so remember, for the vector field, we have to ensure this condition that uh, uh, tells us that the flow uh, preserves the volume. And there is also a technical point. All this problem is translation invariant. You don't want vector fields which only translate your set. They are not interested. So you have to ensure that your vector field does not give rise to a flow which is purely translational. And this is given by this condition. OK, so these are the admissible vector fields. The theorem at this point that we have with Asherby and Morini is that take a critical point. As you know, this is a necessary condition to be a local minimizer. Solution of this equation. Assume that the second derivative is positive along all admissible vector fields, then you are a local minimizer. So effectively, calculus work in this example. But you have even something more. Because as you know from calculus, not only you have, uh, when you are a minimum uh, local minimizer, you have also Taylor expansion. Here you have a sort of Taylor expansion. Which, because you have also this quadratic term. Not only you are telling me that you are a minimizer, but you are also controlling how much you increase the energy passing from me to F by the square of the distance. The square is by no chance a square, because it's a sort of, 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 of uh, uh, as I say, Taylor expansion. OK, I don't want to seem too trivial. I mean, the proof of this theorem is not easy at all. It takes more than 30 pages. But the idea, uh, the, this is what I want to convey, is in the end very, very simple. Of course, we were lucky because not always the simple ideas work. OK, but this is the result. This is the result. And now I want to devote my last 15 minutes to explain you what are the applications and the consequences of this. 
this is a minimality criterion. If you are a critical uh, point, solve this equation, and second variation is positive, then you are a local minimizer. Okay, first consequence, which is just a corollary, it's already tells you something interesting. When gamma is equal to zero, when you are just a, me, uh, uh, a guy which uh, uh, satisfies the mean curvature equation and have the second variation of the perimeter which is strictly positive, which means this, this is telling you that then you are a local minimizer with respect to the L1 distance and you have also a quantitative estimate. This was not a new result because uh, I learned first about this by reading a paper of Brian White when he shows that uh, in this case you get a local minimality with respect to L infinity is a slightly weaker result uh, perturbation. And then I know this paper by Morgan, Frank Morgan is here, and Ross where they prove in a more general situation we only deal, but the idea is the same. Uh, again, this L1 local minimality uh, with the restriction that, uh, and the dimension is smaller than or equal than seven that we don't have here. But the point I want to make here is that not only you get minimality, but you get this. So in particular, this corollary implies the quantitative isoperimetric inequality. Yeah, but I don't want to talk about this. So let me show you, and this is just a curiosity. I mean, this result is already non-trivial if you only think uh, about the perimeter. But let's go to the uh, pattern formation. The first application of our result is global minimality of a single lamella. Uh, tells you that uh, in which cases the very simple pattern, which is you are inside a cube and here there is material E and here is, there is the complement. So the, the, the simplest case, when this is in fact possible, when this pattern is possible, because uh, as a consequence we have this theorem. Assume that L, sorry, now in this slide I called the set. L is the unique up to translation and relax because you can you have all the, the symmetries that you have in the, in the flat torus. Assume that, uh, suppose that this is the global minimizer of the periodic isoperimetric problem. It's the guy which minimizes globally the perimeter among all sets inside the torus which have the same volume. Assume this is a minimi the minimizing the perimeter, then this guy is also the unique global minimizer of this more complicated energy, provided the constant gamma is sufficiently small. So if the constant is sufficiently small, and you have just two sets, E and a complement, if the guy L uh, minimizes the perimeter with the fixed volume, that, that guy is also a global minimizer for this. Then you say, okay, very well. We know which are uh, global minimizers for the perimeter in the square or in the cube. Unfortunately, this is not so. We know in the square, we know that in the square, if the amount of mass, remember this is, I'm considering the unit square. So if the amount of mass here is between 1 over pi and 1 minus 1 over pi. Frank, I think I, this is the, the, the correct number. <laughs> you know better than me. Then, then this is minimizing the perimeter among the sets with the same area. But uh, in fact, uh, if uh, uh, the area is smaller, we know that the minimizing guy the guy which minimizes the perimeter given the area inside the square is this guy. If you are in higher dimension, things is not clear. This is quite surprising. Even in dimension three. In dimension three, now suppose this is a cube. If we know that these two areas approximately one, these two volumes are approximately one half and one half, we know that this guy minimizes the perimeter and by our theorem, also minimizes this more complicated energy. But if the volume of L is smaller, uh, well, we have a conjecture. Uh, what is the conjecture? Okay, the conjecture is that 
This is the situation inside the cube if you are at one half, one half and one half. Then if the mass of L is smaller, will be this for a while, and then suddenly, if the mass is very small, the guy will be a quarter of a cylinder uh, leaned and close to the wall of the cube. And if the, the mass is even smaller, will be one-eighth of a ball, okay? Which is leaning in the cube. But this is, I'm talking of dimension three, and I'm talking of relative isoperimetric, uh, relative isoperimetric uh, uh, sets inside the cube, so nothing really complicated, but this is still uh, not known as far as I know. Okay, so, but this is one, in any case, our theorem tells you, okay, if you know the global minimizers of the perimeter, that the lamella is a global minimizing of the perimeter inside uh, torus, then this is also a global minimizer for our set. But as I said, we are interested to local minimizers. And here there is another application of our theorem to local minimality of multiple of the case in which you are a multiple lamella. So now I'm talking, this is in any dimension, of the case where you have multiple strips as in the pictures that you saw. So this is your set T, this is again E, E, and E, okay, this is, okay. Then the theorem, uh, well, it is an easy consequence of our result, because as I say, this is a case where you can show that the guy solves the, this equation, and this is a case where by hands you can prove that the second variation the second derivative is strictly positive, so, so you just apply the theorem. And the proposition is that fix the volume and fix gamma, fix the fraction of the volume that you want and fix gamma, then there exists a, a, an integer kappa naught such that if you allow for sufficiently many lameller, lamelle, uh, then the guy, this LK, which has K lamelle, is a strict local minimizer. So no matter how big is gamma, no matter how small is the volume fraction of your set, if you decide that you want to have many lamella, this is something which uh, people observe in the real world, then this guy is uh, a local minimizer, if it has sufficiently many strips. Another application, which, which is really an extension of our result, is due to Cicalese and Spadaro. Okay, here there is the statement, but I don't want to, for, I leave to the expert uh, reading the statement. I will just explain the result, the, the result by, by Cicalese and Spadaro with a picture. If you remember at the beginning, I say, if the amount of the first material is small, you have several droplets. So Cicalese and Spadaro, they did the following. Okay, this is our container. They deal with the non-periodic case. Assume that we have a very, very small amount of one of the two material. Then the result is that this material will be placed as a droplet inside the container. And the droplet, uh, okay, and the droplet is very close to a sphere in uh, C1 sense. Moreover, if the container is a ball, so no matter the shape of the container, if the amount of the, energy of, of the material is very small, then the droplet would be more and more close to a ball. If instead the container is a ball, the droplet, if you are, again, under a certain critical amount, the droplet will be precisely a ball. Uh, I say this is an extension because, uh, as I said, we studied the problem in the periodic setting, and uh, instead, uh, here, they don't deal with the periodic setting. Well, they, but they use an extension of our result to non-periodic, a non-trivial extension of our result, I have to say, to non-periodic case given by Yulin and Pisant uh, in 2014. Uh, finally, uh, let me conclude with a more recent uh, application of our result, which uh, 
in some sense uh, closes the story. It is a very nice result by uh, Christopheri of the last year, which says the following. Okay, now you see this ball. This ball, when gamma is equal to zero, when the energy is just the perimeter, is a minimizer of the perimeter under the volume constraint. Okay, if you take gamma very small, it is clear that uh, maybe the ball is not anymore a local minimizer, but uh, you have a local minimizer which is very, again, you are taking a big mass inside, but gamma very small, then your local minimizer will solve this equation, and uh, we have second variation, positive second variation. It will be not precisely a ball, but uh, a small deformation of the ball. This is reasonable. Well, Christopher uh, proved this very nice fact. Suppose that uh, gamma is fixed. Gamma can be very large. Then what you can prove is that you cannot expect that the ball is a minimizer, or I'm talking about the ball, but I could start by with any period, uh, any periodic uh, uh, local minimizer of the perimeter. I cannot expect that the ball of a small deformation of the ball is a minimizer, but what he proved is that if gamma is very big, if I allow to repeat the pattern many times, sufficiently many times, I can prove that uh, uh, a local minimizer will be given by a small deformation of the original ball. So this explains very well, in, in a rigorous way, this application, why the spots are uh, local minimizers. Okay, I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.